If you have your Bibles, please turn to Zephaniah. The book of Zephaniah is where we are going to be this morning. Today we're actually going to cover through chapter 3, verse 8. Uh, but then next week we'll actually finish the book starting in 3, verse 9. It's only three chapters, but there's a ris- reason for that division. And I'll uh, give you more of that a little bit later. But Zephaniah is an interesting book. Um, in fact, it reminds me a bit of this uh, push we've seen over the last 15 or so years uh, in cinema, which is there's just been prequel after prequel. Um, I'm not always a fan of prequels. Uh, it depends, I guess, on the genre of the movie because you have to really love stories to like prequels because it fills in gaps, but you kind of know how it's going to end because you've already seen that movie, right? Um, but to see the character development and all that, um, that can be helpful, it can be nice, it can be fun. Um, you know, years ago, I'm a big fan of Tolkien, have been for um, my whole life. Um, maybe like some of you, when I was just a little kid, I, I, I bought my first paperback, and that was my first paperback, was The Hobbit, and it was just because the cover of the book was really cool. So, I mean, that was, that was about it. But I did eventually read it, and it's become a, a, a fan favorite in our own home. The Hobbits, they came out. You know, it's a great story. Uh, I, I'm very sympathetic for uh, different mediums of expression. So a movie doesn't have to be perfect uh, related to a book. It's different. And so I actually really enjoyed that. Um, not as much as Lord of the Rings. We've seen it with Batman. There's always a new James Bond. Never figured out that as far as uh, just everything about it, really. Um, and then also Star Trek. And Star Trek did a really interesting thing because they just basically brought in someone from a different dimension and ended up resetting everything so they can tell all new stories if they want to, at least movie-wise. Um, it's, it's, it's been an interesting thing to watch. Um, I don't mention Star Wars simply because of Jar Jar Binks. I, I hate, um, basically, if you want to see what it looks like to rip out the reminiscent joy of a little child and then pull it out, stomp it, bury it in the ground, and then... I don't know, have it dug up and and devoured by some terrible creature. That's pretty much what Jar Jar Binks did to me when it came to Star Wars. And that's actually understated, um, just to let you know. But in the course of it, what we see is Zephaniah actually acts a little bit like a prequel to what we just finished with, with Habakkuk. He wrote this book about 20 years prior to Habakkuk writing his. With Habakkuk, we saw the Assyrian invasion beginning and starting, but he was also looking forward to the Babylonian invasion that was to come. So if you remember, and to catch you up, at this period of time, around the 700, 600 B.C. time, what we have is these three uh, sequential conquerings that will go on with the split kingdoms. We had the northern kingdom that was going to be conquered and was conquered by the Assyrians. Hezekiah and his leadership helped stave off by God's sovereignty uh, the conquering of Assyria for the southern kingdom. They were sustained for that first invasion. The second invasion, however, was going to be Babylon. Babylon was going to finish up whatever was left of north, but take all of south and actually at the same time, also then judge Assyria, whom God had used in the first invasion to discipline the northern kingdom. God is able to do all these things with singular actions. And that sovereignty actually accomplishes both discipline of his own children, even judgment for his enemies. And as surely as we think, oh, great, they're finally getting theirs, then you finally realize also that it's also part of, I don't want to say you getting yours, but at least waking up to where perhaps you have veered from trusting in the only God of the cosmos, the God that you're supposed to have covenant with. Now, with Zephaniah, what we have is basically this 20 years prior. He, he is looking at the Assyrian invasion, doesn't mention anything about Babylon. And actually, there's, there's really not a lot of specifics given us in this book. Zephaniah does not give a lot of real detail when it comes to the day of the Lord. And when you hear the day of the Lord in the Minor Prophets, but especially in this particular book where we are right now, you're going to understand it to be, it, it's really a little bit of a both end. There's a hist- an historic day of the Lord, where, for instance, when he says the day of the Lord, and he might be mentioning that Babylon is going to accomplish this. It's going to be awful. It's going to be terrible. Sin is going to be judged, and God's enemies are going to be laid waste. I mean, it sounds very harsh, but one thing that we see with the lack of specifics is what Zephaniah really wants us to see, which is no matter how harsh this sounds, this is actually exactly the just deserts of sin. No matter how the description looks, this is not God being petty or vengeful in the sense of he's like super extra angry and he's going to give them even worse than they have given him, so to speak. No, this is an expression of God's holy and righteous character up against sin and its effects. 
And part of that is his jealous guarding of the worship of his people. And again, it's not because of some, that we have some precarious God sitting on a throne that's basically a rocking chair and it goes back and forth teetering on whether or not people like him enough. He is not a Greek mythological God. He knows that to give his own people the greatest and best and most enjoyable thing is to give them himself. And they rob themselves of that joy when they go after other gods, which is exactly what they've done. Zephaniah's name means that Yahweh has hidden or protected. There's something in that when it comes to both judgment of enemies and also deliverance of God's people. You know, we have this phrase that there's always a remnant, and there is. God does sustain his people. But what we see in here is a picture that God is going to do so not just now and not just of Israel, but he's going to do it in the future and of Israel and nations. We are getting a foretaste of what happened way back in Genesis chapter 12 in the original covenant that was created with Abram and that God was going to bless the nations through him that we start to see here kind of in the middle, so to speak, this end time expression that God is going to finish that work. He's going to keep his promise. But along the course, God's character, his promises, and his mercy never change because God never changes. That's one of the beauties of seeing the, the, the perspective that the minor prophets give us is that we understand that God is always the same. And that's actually a comfort for us because what does happen in real time? In real time, we may see Assyrian types, Babylonian types, or the third group would be the Persian types. We might see these other kinds of enemies or those who are against the things of God victorious in our lifetimes. We may see that it looks like the wicked flourish. But the scriptures remind us to endure. The scriptures remind us that God will work this out in his way, in his time. He will accomplish this. He will do this. And this is so essential for us to understand because we do live in a fallen world. And really, when you look at the effects of sin, whether it's global and geopolitical or just even personal in your lives, you really do have a choice, either to believe that God is not sovereign, he is not good, or he is, he is other, he is trustworthy, and he will work this out in the end. If for some that means that makes it a crutch, fine. But ultimately, it just simply means that as we look at Scripture, we are reminded again and again and again to endure. So God has, in a sense, hidden the fact that he is going to continue to keep these things moving, even in the midst of what appears to be chaos. Now, again, this is about 20 years prior to Habakkuk, but one other kind of point of reference that I think is important to remember about the writing of Zephaniah is it happened about the same time as Josiah's reforms that were occurring right before Assyria. So in Judah and in Jerusalem, Josiah came into leadership and part of his leadership was to renovate the temple. In the course of renovating the temple, they rediscovered a portion of the book of the law. And as they read it, and this reminds me again of what will happen, goodness, um, I don't know, a couple hundred years later. 150 or so, when Ezra and Nehemiah then take the group that Persia then releases back to Jerusalem and Nehemiah, <clears throat> excuse me, builds the wall, they also rediscover the book of the law and they also then rediscover some practices. Well, that's what Josiah did way back here with Zephaniah. They had seen some things that they thought they were doing well, but what happened was Josiah, as he's reading the book of the law, realizes that they need to renew the covenant, not because God has changed, nor because the terms of the covenant had changed. In fact, it was the realization of the terms of the covenant that caused them to have a seri almost a revival, a bit of a, a point of repentance, and yet it didn't stick. Why? Because the present circumstances look like, hey, we're trying to follow God, and now we have warring armies coming against us. Oh, let's go ahead and go back to when things were great, and there was lots of money pouring in. Let's go back to worship false gods, because that's what we do. We grow weary of waiting for what we do not see and we try to make it happen. We try to make it happen right here, right now. And we think in principle we're justified because these are good things God would want us to do. 
or experience, but we forget that God cares about how. If you cannot worship God and God alone, trusting him in the means that you do not see, you will not worship him when you accomplish all the means that you're pursuing. You can just write it down. It is a guarantee and it's historically proven. His theme is the day of the Lord is at hand, both again, immediate and historic, but also something that is future, a day that we don't know. We know that that day ultimately is gonna be both judgment and deliverance. Judgment for those who are not, do not have their faith rested solely in the God of the universe who provides for us a Messiah, but also then deliverance for those who do, who do trust God's plan that God has set aside to be his own. And again, the emphasis here without the specifics is on God, his character, why he does it, not necessarily the when, the how, the puzzle pieces. He wants to awaken his people to a grateful and a hopeful endurance in light of what's going on presently. These imperatives, and we don't actually have a ton of imperatives in this book, but the imperatives we do have will be things like, we need to weep, we need to wait, we need to obey in the midst. It is not ever based on circumstance, whether or not we obey the Lord's commands. James Montgomery Boyce, who was the long-term, long-time pastor at Tith Presbyterian in Philly, he said this about it. He, said, he believes that Zephaniah is a great and good summary of the first nine minor prophets. It doesn't really work out sequentially. Like I said, this is basically a prequel to the book prior. But it does give us specific accounts right before Habakkuk, um, which is the last account we have before the Babylonian exile. In fact, a lot of guys really do divide up the 12 minor prophets like this. You have the first nine that are pre-exilic. And ex Pre-exilic would be basically when they are exiled out into Babylon, but then eventually released because Persia comes in and Cyrus, whom Isaiah prophesied would come and release them, not for necessarily any great reasons, just practical, but for God, it was a sovereign restoration of Jerusalem and the regathering of his people. So the first nine, you really have this pre-exilic uh, description of what the people were like. But then in the last three of the minor prophets that we'll be heading into in a couple of weeks, we really start to get the exilic and post-exilic period leading up to that intertestamental period of about 400, 450 years that's filled with names that you would know like Alexander the Great and um, the Roman Empire that would come in. Uh, and, and boy, there, there's some others, Maccabees, others that would, that would be part of history that you would have even studied apart from Scripture. But it's important, I think, for us to see how this works out and how really, with the lack of specifics, the placement in our scriptures of Zephaniah acts not just as sort of a prequel, but it is almost a, a summary of the spirit of what we've seen in the pre-exilic period of who God is, who God's people are, the nations, and what's to come. Now, <clears throat> this question that we've posed at the very beginning is how can you and I be thankful when everything just hurts? When it just hurts, when we're going through difficulty and pain, how in the world can we be thankful? What's to be thankful for? Well, God is lifting up our heads in this text. He is lifting up our heads to see and to know that there are still things worth being thankful for. In fact, he and he alone is the worthiness, the great worthwhile of our gratitude. So first of all, we're going to see this. This week or today, we're going to look at God is God in judgment. He remains God. That's one reason we can be thankful. God is still God. But next week, when we look at those final few verses in chapter three, we're gonna see that God is also God in deliverance. That's really the simple division of this. One through one, one through three, eight, you have God is the God of judgment. But then nine through the end of the chapter of chapter three, we have that God is the God in salvation and deliverance. So there's only one God. Let's look at the text itself in Zephaniah 1, 1 through 9. I'm not going to read the whole thing, but I would encourage you at some point to go through Zephaniah and just simply underline all of the I will statements of God in this book. It's pretty telling. The word of the Lord that came to Zephaniah, the son of Cushi, son of Gedaliah, son of Amariah, son of Hezekiah, in the days of Josiah, the son of Ammon, king of Judah. I will utterly sweep away everything from the face of the earth, declares the Lord. What a beginning. <laughs> okay, thanks, Zephaniah. This is going to be fun. Let's go. 
I will sweep away man and beast. I will sweep away the birds of the heavens and the fish of the sea and the rubble with the wicked. I will cut off mankind from the face of the earth, declares the Lord. I will stretch out my hand against Judah and against all the inhabitants of Jerusalem. And they're going, wait a minute, we were, we're your chosen. Why does this happen? Well, he'll explain. And I will also cut off from the, this place the remnant of Baal and the name of the idolatrous priests along with the priests. Those who bow down on the roofs to the host of the heavens, those who bow down and swear to the Lord and yet swear by Milcom, false God, those who have turned back from following the Lord, who do not seek the Lord or inquire of him. Okay, so he's bringing judgment there because they have forsaken the Lord their God and gone after other gods. It's plain and simple. Be silent before the Lord, verse 7, for the day of the Lord is near. The Lord has prepared a sacrifice and consecrated his guests. And on the day of the Lord's sacrifice, I will punish the officials and the king's sons and all who array themselves in foreign attire. And on that day, I will punish everyone who leaps over the threshold and those who fill their master's house with violence and fraud. I mean, basically, he's getting even down into households here. He's saying basically at every corner of this land, every corner of this city that was to represent God's relationship with his people, they have infested it, allowed it to be infested. And he's particularly bringing judgment with the leaders and the priests who have allowed these practices to continue. He's coming down. Verse 10, on that day, declares the Lord, a cry will be heard from the fish gate, a wail from the second quarter, a loud crash from the hills, wail, O inhabitants of the mortar. For all the traitors are no more, all who weigh out silver are cut off. At that time, I will search Jerusalem with lamps and I will punish the men who are complacent. Those who say in their hearts, the Lord will not do good, nor will he do ill. Basically saying, He's silent. He's not even paying attention. Their goods shall be plundered and their houses laid waste. Though they build houses, they shall not inhabit them. Though they plant vineyards, they shall not drink wine from them. The great day of the Lord is near, near and hastening fast. The sound of the day of the Lord is bitter. The mighty man cries aloud there. A day of wrath is coming, a day of distress and anguish, a day of ruin and devastation, a day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and thick darkness, a day of trumpet blast and battle cry against the fortified cities and against the lofty battlements. I will bring distress on mankind so that they shall walk like the blind because they have sinned against the Lord. Their blood shall be poured out like dust and their flesh like dung. Neither shall uh, their silver nor their gold shall be able to deliver them on the day of the wrath of the Lord. In the fire of his jealousy, all the earth shall be consumed for a full and sudden end. He will make of all the inhabitants of the earth. Light reading. He is making it very clear and giving great description as to what it's going to look like, feel like, and that there is no escape to what's coming. Now, when he starts in chapter 2, he does deal with there will be judgment on Judah's enemies. So it is coming against Judah and Jerusalem, but it's also going to come against the enemies. Why? Because God is God. And so the hard lesson for those enemies is this God that you have never followed but you have heard about and perhaps you've even seen historically in the righteous works of those who would come out of Jerusalem, you need to understand that that God has always been the only God and there is now going to be a reckoning. And you have boasted against this God and said that there is no real God here. The God is in our might. It's in our power. It's in our money. But the problem is that very thinking has made its way into Jerusalem. And the shock for them is going to be just because you are Israel doesn't mean you're okay. Because covenant means there are terms. Covenant means there are promises. But those promises will not be for those who do not keep their end of the bargain. Which is part of what we end up seeing in the future where we understand that it is in Christ alone who could keep that end of the bargain. See, Moses brought in the law. And this is why we read what we read in, in uh, Romans Moses brought in the law to give detail to the terms that are needed to be kept in order to be a people of the covenant. And what does the law do? The law simply exposes that we are completely unable to keep that bargain. 
We cannot keep it. So was he tricking us? No, because from the very beginning, God made very clear that it was to his offspring that was coming the fulfillment of these promises and the covenant keeper was gonna be this one person whom he would provide, God in the flesh, Jesus Christ. He's the only one who would ever meet the righteous covenant demands that God had established with his people. But it still means that in the meantime, they have to trust that it's God who will make this provision and God who will keep these promises. But because they did not see the payoff, they did not see the earthly kingdom being established, they grew weary and they went after other gods from other nations whom they saw succeeding. There is one God. He is coming in verses one through nine of chapter one. It says very clearly, he is coming against Judah. He rules. He is to be worshiped. These false gods should not be worshiped. They should not be followed. It is absolutely a travesty and heresy and blasphemy up against the God who has delivered them out of Egypt, who has preserved them over and over and over again, shown his grace and his mercy. And yet they have shown in the midst that he is not trustworthy. And they therefore went after other gods As others have put it, Hosea, for instance, they have whored after other lovers in place of God. In fact, even here you see God's description saying that they're just, they don't even pay attention to me. They're not even acknowledging that God is. As he says, this surely is happening. It starts to say God is going to move. If you look verse 10, he says on that day, here's what's going to happen. And here is in this section 10 through 13, we have the first imperative of this book, which is in verse 11, wail, weep, cry, lament. It's really one of the first points that we should have when it comes to returning to the Lord. Perhaps in the midst of this, even though a lot of this seems historical, maybe a lot of this is well beyond any Sunday school studies that you've ever been a part of in your life. But do hear the themes, do hear the message. And that is this, sin deserves everything that I've already described. And those who have an inkling of following God and yet have gone after other gods, whether it's money or sex or power or something else to realize heaven on earth in your kingdom, you realize that you actually deserve that, but yet he has offered you grace and he's offered you mercy. And in the midst of that, we have to understand that as he is coming, we are called to wail. We are called and even commanded to weep at the loss, to weep at our lack of faith, to weep because of our sin. We don't even blush. He makes it clear in this section that he will look into hearts and homes. This is not just a global thing where you think maybe you could hide out in the corner of your house and miss it. This goes back to Passover kind of language at the deliverance out of Exodus. If you do not apply the blood of the sacrificial lamb, death will find its way into every corner of every home that is not atoned for. He's going to judge those who are fakers. Verses 12 and 13, we've already read read this, but he basically is talking about practical atheists. People who you might say, well, that's agnostic. Well, it's not really because... Some people live, they will acknowledge with their lips that God, oh yes, of course, I believe God. I mean, I'm a Christian, I'm American, I'm a Christian, blah, blah, blah. But a practical atheist, what if your belief system, what if your technical on paper beliefs could only be put down according to what you actually practice? How long would your personal statement of faith be? What if it wasn't just stuff that you can utter with your mouth? What if literally your lips could not move unless it was guaranteed in your life, observed by God, that if you're gonna say, oh yes, I believe he's God and he's in control, but if you don't rest in that, if you don't practice that faith, your lips would not be released and your tongue could not move and you would be forced to say, I don't believe. What if you say, oh, I believe when he preached the the Sermon on the Mount and we see the Beatitudes, that it's the meek that'll inherit the earth. I believe the fruit of the Spirit, that love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, that is the mark of a true believer. I believe it. But you are screaming, cursing, and cussing at everyone who doesn't believe like you do. Your lips are sealed. Your tongue will not wag. It is not what you believe. God will judge the fakers, the posers, as we used to put it back in the 80s. For those of us, they would wear vans, but we've never put our feet on a skateboard. 
In honor of that, I bought one of my daughters some van shoes. Your opposer, he will judge those who claim to know something, dress up like it, talk like it, but it's far from their hearts. And why? Well, it's because 14 through 18, the last part of chapter one, it's because he is just. The great day of the Lord is near and hastening the sound of the day of the Lord. It's the day of the Lord. That's the prepositional phrase. It's of the Lord. This ain't about you. This is about the glory of God in his creation, the holiness of God that will put forth the glory and the bounty. And he would be seen as unjust, unfair, even unkind if over all of time he lets evil win in all forms. So it's not just the enemies. It's not just the, the as we'll read about the Edomites or the Amorites or, or the Gazans. It will not just be those who have always had false practices and had child worship and, or, and I'm sorry, child sacrifice and other things. It will not be just those. It will be those who had the law, those who had the covenant promises, but they have forsaken him and they've gone after other loves. He is just all the time. But we also thankfully see, starting in chapter 2, that he's merciful. I mean, he's levied here. Here's, the, here's my judgment against you. And, he's, and he is judge, jury, and executioner because he's perfect. He's holy. And in that, we see what sin deserves. And we see in chapter 2, he does remind that Judah's enemies will be judged. He says, gather together, yes, gather, O shameless nation, before the decree takes effect. Before the day passes away like chaff, before there comes upon you the burning anger of the Lord, before this, the whole idea that there is even something that could come before. He says, seek the Lord, all you humble of the land who do his just commands. Seek righteousness, seek humility. Perhaps you may be hidden on the day of the anger of the Lord. Essentially saying, perhaps you'll be part of the remnant that always he preserves. But it's not about works. It's about giving evidence. These things, you can't just work to be humble today. This is evidence of returning to the law of the Lord, the rediscovery that Josiah made of the law of God is to say that he's God, I am not. And when I do sin, there must be sacrifice, but that sacrifice doesn't exist. We know in the future in Hebrews that the writer of Hebrews says, the blood of bulls and goats was never meant to atone for sin once and for all. It was always just a point in time relief but it was always to point to something greater. But even still, they're given these practices. It's all they've got at the time. In the midst of, you know what else is in the book of the law? You have all the way back in Genesis 3, the promise of someone who will come, who will bear the wrath and who will conquer the enemy long before he made a promise to Abram. You know, this reminds me of the woman at the well when Christ met up with her. She was a Samaritan, right? Right? And they, they spoke a little bit about where there would be, whether it would be worship on Mount Gerizim or where they'd be in Jerusalem at the temple. And this woman whom Christ confronted and said, you know, you're right that you don't have a husband. You actually have about five different somethings that you had along the way, whether it's husbands or men or lovers, whatever the case is. But here's the deal. She says, we know that there is one that is coming like Moses. Do you know what a Samaritan believes? Do you know what their scripture is? Book of the law. They completely reject all the other part of the New Testament, I mean, of the Old Testament. They only, only accept the book of the law. The very thing that Josiah rediscovered. And Josiah and them, Israel. Jewish. Samaritans, I mean, they're historically Jewish, but ethnically no longer. And their religious practice ignores everything but the book of the law. And yet she is able, this woman who's had lover after lover, whatever we might say about her, I'm not going to try to be, you know, edgy and say, well, she's a whore. I have no idea, but we know she wasn't faithful. We know what she, know, we know she had some practices that were at the very least sketchy, and yet she knows there's going to be one who comes like Moses that's a prophet. And she says, are you this one? And we'll know when we worship, she says, on Mount Gerizim. I mean, whatever Sunday school class she went to, it was only based on the book of the law. That's what Josiah and them recovered. They know there's a promised one coming. 
If you're going to believe that, there's going to be a measure of humility and submission. This is evidence. This is not a works-based salvation. This is evidence that everything you've said back in chapter 1, that he claims that you're just a poser, you're a faker, if you actually believe it and start to bear these marks, then perhaps you'll be one that God will sustain. He'll keep you alive, so to speak, and you'll be part of that remnant of those who will be with him one day. God is merciful to even allow such a thing in the midst of all that we deserve is incredible mercy. If there's no other point but that for you to gain right now, it is simply evil and sin deserves everything that we've read about in chapter one. And the fact that God even gives us what we see at the beginning of chapter two, an offering of return. He doesn't say he's not going to judge and do everything in chapter one. He just says you might live through it. He is judge. And we see starting in 2, 4 through 3, 8, that he is judge of Jerusalem and he's judge of all the nations. First of all, if you look at the nations, first, verse 4, for Gaza shall be deserted and then and Ashkelon shall become desolation, Ashdod. He goes through all these. He speaks of Ekron, the Cherethites, others, Canaan, the land of the Philistines. I mean, basically all these nations that they would know to be warring nations against Israel, they are going to be judged. But keep in mind that they had not seen any of this happening in their lifetimes. They have ceased to believe that God is picking up their cause and fighting on their behalf. Why? Because when you do not remind yourself of God and do not trust to follow his practices, you forget the fact that he is infinite. You forget the fact that he's not finite like you. You forget the fact that God is not slow in keeping his promises, but when he keeps his promises, they are always perfectly kept in perfect time for his glory for all of time. He's not bound by our clock. That clock exists to remind us that we are not him. He is the judge and he will come against these enemies and he will come against them clearly. And he even speaks, I think, of a serious future destruction in, in verses 13 through 15, if you look at chapter 2. And he will stretch out his hand against the north and destroy Assyria. And will make Nineveh a desolation, a dry waste like the desert. Remember, Nineveh is that capital of Assyria. This is going to happen. But again, they're not seeing it. They're only seeing that their enemies are winning. But he is careful to say that this judgment that comes is coming for both Jerusalem as well as these nations. It's easy to go, oh, finally. They're getting theirs, like we said at the beginning. But God is faithful to remind them that where God is, God's nature is sustained no matter what flesh is present. All flesh will be judged. But the good news is, and this is why we are dividing this up to be next week, is that when you look how chapter uh, 3 verse 8 ends, what we'll see in chapter uh, 3 verse 9 is a song of hope. But instead of it being just a song of hope for Jerusalem, it ends up being a song of hope of the remnant that will be gathered from all the nations. Again, keeping that covenant promise made through Abram. In chapter 3, it says, Woe to her who is rebellious and defiled, the oppressing city. She listens to no voice. She accepts no correction. She does not trust in the Lord. She does not draw near to her God. I mean, speaking of Jerusalem here, there is going to be judgment here. Her officials within her are roaring lions. Her judges are evening wolves. They leave nothing till the morning. Her prophets are fickle, treacherous men. Her priests profane what is holy. They do violence to the law. The Lord within her is righteous. He does no injustice. Every morning he shows forth his justice. Each dawn he does not fail. But the unjust knows no shame. So I mean, we see it's going to be expressed even to Jerusalem. And the things that he levies here against them is that she is filled with pride. Is one of the first things that he says. She is filled with pride, thinking that she needs nothing from the very God who creates the morning, who creates the dawn, who reminds them that there are mercies aplenty, and yet they ignore it because they think that within themselves, within their own judgment, within their own sense of righteousness, which even as he speaks of those who levy righteousness, judges and priests, that they're doing it for their own selfish gain. They are showing their pride in separating themselves from trusting in the Lord. You know, some of you remember Richard Nixon, who, if you look historically up against 
Ronald Reagan's probably, they're probably the two greatest presidents related to foreign policy. They were actually, if you're a history nut and like to read some of that, they both were fantastic when it comes to foreign policy. But we, of course, know that Nixon's uh, everything was, was more than tarnished because of what happened at Watergate. But here's what he said about it. He said, I'm innocent. <laughs> it wasn't just a rampant denial of something that he did wrong. But it's part of the pride of self-deception of this, that the end justifies the means. There's a lot of people who had no problem with Watergate because of what the files produced. But aside from the whole conversation that we could speak about what will cause the end of democracy is by completely ignoring rule of law, just looking spiritually speaking, God is levying this accusation against his people. All this time you've flourished, you've had food. These things are things that God promised that he would do to take care of his people. But they did it in God dishonoring, God denying ways. One man once said, he says, I've spent the best years of my life giving people the lighter pleasures and all I get is abuse. I'm the existence of a hunted man, Al Capone. Judah was prideful in their so-called privilege with God, but they ignored that being saved by God was not automatic just because they were chosen. It's evidence in repentance and faith towards God that gives evidence of fruit of humility. So to make it contemporary, there's no security in salvation, in baptism, church membership, the Lord's table, mission trips, charitable contributions. You can do all the things on the outside. You can be an absolute, complete poser and still be filled with pride. He goes on and speaks of injustice, their false worship, that they have forsaken God who has delivered them. He is coming against his own, just as he will come against the nations. Because God is God and we are not. So even though we're not getting to the good news part, really, I would argue actually that there is some good news in the midst of what we've read at the last part of two and all of chapter one. And that is those first few verses of chapter two, which speak of whale. At the end of chapter one, whale going into the beginning of two where he says, if you do this, if you repent, if you have faith, then in the midst of circumstances that are not going to change, I will preserve you. I will deliver you. We can be thankful because whatever is happening in the circumstance, God is God. This is why we can be thankful when everything just hurts as difficult as it is to think that God either causes or allows all things, that is still a better query, that is still a better thing for us to wonder about than whether or not God's even paying attention at all and being a practical atheist. We trust because we do not see clearly, but this is why we remind ourselves of what the scriptures say. This is why we would gather as the people of God, or if you are without him, that perhaps as you have seen circumstances, either globally or, or just personally, that are just causing you to reach out, we are not saying that coming to Christ will alleviate your difficulty, but it will give you purpose and hope for a future that is only one that he can secure for you. He is God no matter what. And the scriptures and histories like this that we see with Zephaniah as a prequel to Habakkuk, summarizing these first nine minor prophet books of what's to come, even before they go into exile with Babylon, we see that regardless of the circumstances, God is still God. And there is delivering hope and there will be justice for those that are opposed to him. But the key is not sitting there hoping for that day to come as much as make sure that you're not in that category. Are you his? You'll be marked by humility, trust, and endurance if you are. 
We can be thankful because regardless of what may appear, he is going to do these things. And in doing these things, both judgment against the unrighteous will mean deliverance for his own. So when he does come again one day, we know that regardless of what you think about timelines, we know this, that when he comes, and it is physical and it is visible, there will be a judging of the living and the dead. And those that he comes, it says he will no longer come to deal with sin. He's already done that. He will come in judgment to reckon. And in doing so, either those who have not trusted in him will be judged and there will be no other offering for salvation. Or those that are in Christ will actually see that as, yes, it'll be awful, but in the awesome, awful kind of ways. We will be overwhelmed, but then we also know that is the day of our deliverance. That is the day when all judgment will be exacted perfectly. That is the day when mercy will be experienced far more than just what we've experienced in our lifetimes of, oh God, I should be so, I'm better off than I deserve, right? I, I don't mind that kind of response when I say, how, do you, how are you doing? It's a decent, consistent response, better than I deserve, of course. Okay, but if that becomes too comfortable, let's go back to Zephaniah and read exactly what you do deserve. That'll remind us even more. What a grace. And that day of deliverance will be far greater than anything we could imagine or think. We can be thankful because while he waits to judge, he issues warnings. God issues warnings so that those who have ears to hear will respond to the warnings. You don't issue warnings if it's going to do nothing. And he warns so that some, some, just that remnant who will believe and have faith would respond and be a little glimmer of hope in the midst of all the destruction going on around you. I know this feels apocalyptic, but good grief, what buffer do we have in the West of all the things that go on around us? I'm not trying to scare anyone. I'm just simply saying, it's not going to go from bad to worse and then get better before he comes. There are some who have those perspectives theologically about the end times. I don't. Warnings are a kindness. And the warning in chapter 2 verse 3 is seek the Lord. Matthew 6, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. So ask yourself, what kingdoms are you seeking? Is it really his or are you most anxious about a kingdom that you can see, put your hands on, and maybe share in the building of? Is that what, get, what stokes you the most? Is that what gives you the, I don't know why I have all this kind of surfer, uh, kind of skateboard language today. But anyway, sorry, poser and stokes. It's kind of weird. My hair's getting kind of long though, so maybe it's all that. Whatever the case is, guys, we have to get to this place where we understand that these warnings are a kindness so that we would seek. But what we seek is his kingdom. And what does that do? It reminds us it's now and not yet. We see a glimpse of it when we gather as his people. We are part of his kingdom together. If indeed you are in Christ. But ultimately that kingdom is coming and it's not yet. And just as Christ said in Matthew 25, his kingdom's not of this world. Otherwise his people would be fighting. We are waiting for him to consummate his kingdom on his terms in his timeline. Is it his kingdom you are seeking? If so, I'm not saying it makes you perfect or makes you glib or happy-go-lucky. It simply makes you enduring. It gives you hope up against where it appears all hope is gone. And you know what that does? According to 1 Peter, that hope in the midst of those kinds of circumstances, that causes the lost world to say, why in the world do you have hope? And that's where we get the phrase, be ready in season and out of season to make a defense. Seek him while he may be found. We can be thankful because all the judgment we've read about for the nations and even against those posers, the fakers, those who are gone away from him, he poured out all of that judgment ultimately on the person of Jesus Christ. For those that if we believe on him, then Christ we then know has bore the wrath for us. We're saying, Jesus, I believe that you took the judgment that my sin deserves. I should have been the one on the cross. But your mercy is, I absolutely deserve it all. I deserve everything we read about that Zephaniah says is coming to the nations and even to Jerusalem. Whether it's destruction or captivity, I deserve it all because of sin is an affront to a holy and good God. But he put it on Christ. 
So when, when you look at that and go, oh, that doesn't seem right, think about what was poured on Christ for you who believe. And if you believe on him, you know that he did take that wrath. But that was at the end of a life of keeping the covenant promises that would deserve no wrath. Simply satisfying that end of the bargain so that you, like we'll talk about next week, not just the chosen being of Israel at kind of ethnic birth, which again, they didn't understand fully, but what we see in the New Testament, that that new Israel is the church gathered from all the nations, all those who place their faith in the covenant keeper, Christ. So when we look next week, guys, at this salvation that, that comes I mean, I want you to bring with you some of what we've talked about today, but I don't want you to leave today feeling like there's no hope in the message. There is. And I hope that you will see and feel the weight of a holy God up against where are you? Are you seeking first his kingdom in the midst of whatever circumstances you're going through? Because God remains God and we remain not. Let's pray. God, I pray that you would help us even now as we take the Lord's table and, and consider in, in a picture view that your body was broken, you bore that wrath, that your blood was shed, that you atoned for sin, you covered the sin of all who would come to you by faith, that you covered us, that your blood is sufficient for all and your blood is sufficient most applicably for all of our sin, for all time. And that's what we look upon when we see the Lord's table. We see that you bore the wrath for us, but we know it was at the end of a life that was not just well-lived, it was perfectly covenant-keeping lived. So that your satisfaction was met for both what your own people had to live like and also what sin had to be judged by in order for you to have a people in your presence. And Christ ends up not just becoming a way, not just a means. He is inside. He is transplanted. He has not just cleaned up our unrighteousness. He has replaced it. He has exchanged who we were with who he is. When you look upon us, you see the hope of glory, Christ in us. So Lord, for the believer, may we weigh carefully. Are we seekers of your kingdom? If not, let the Lord's table be a reminder that we are not to seek a kingdom of men, but to hope in the kingdom of God and to seek after the markers of what that looks like as followers, as children, as citizens. And really, we should be completely sympathetic with each other, with our circumstance, but in a very real way, it doesn't matter what we're going through, not because it's uncaring, simply because who you are, your love, your patience, and your expectation, that doesn't change. And our hope remains Christ, whether things are good or things are ill. So God, we declare boldly together, those of us in, in the faith, that you are enough. And we ask you to forgive us for not living even this week like you were enough for us. It's in Christ's name we pray, amen.